Nuclear safety officials in the U.S. say they've taken a big step towards making the world a less dangerous place. They say a batch of plutonium has arrived safely from Japan. It's part of their efforts to keep nuclear materials out of the hands of terrorists. The plutonium was used at a research facility in northeastern Japan. A vessel carrying 331 kilograms of weapons-grade material left Japan in March. That's enough to make 40 atomic bombs. U.S. officials say it's arrived uh, safely at a Department of Energy facility in South Carolina. They've said they plan to process it so it, can, it can't be used for weapons. The governor of South Carolina had been trying to stop the plutonium being sent to her state, and citizens groups there have been demanding more information about the shipment. Workers at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant are preparing to take another step toward decommissioning the damaged facility. They want to retrieve spent nuclear fuel. So they're practicing to assemble a metal cover for a reactor building designed to contain radioactive substances. Engineers at Tokyo Electric Power Company plan to install the cover on reactor number three. They'll try to remove more than 500 fuel units from the building as early as next year. Workers are rehearsing the assembly process. They plan to connect the eight parts on top of the reactor building. The building was damaged in 2011 by a hydrogen explosion. And radiation levels are dangerously high around the storage pool. We're checking whether the procedures are safe and efficient. We want to minimize the time workers have to spend on the building. The cover will be dismantled and sent to the plant by ship. The people in charge of Japan's crippled nuclear plant are crafting a new way to contain contamination. They created an underground ice wall to block groundwater, but found parts of it wouldn't freeze. They've told regulators they hope to solve that problem by slowing the water. Workers with Tokyo Electric Power Company began freezing the soil around the reactor buildings in March. They're trying to reduce the amount of groundwater that flows into the basements and gets contaminated. Company representatives told regulators groundwater levels outside the ice wall near the ocean have not fallen. They said one reason may be rain. They claimed the wall is helping, but didn't convince regulators. The company representatives said some parts of the wall are not cold enough. They said they'll pour concrete into the ground nearby to slow the water so it freezes. They said they'll be able to tell whether it's worked in about a month. in need for man's best friend. 
Sumio Yamaguchi runs an NPO that trains rescue dogs and guide dogs in central Japan. He has been looking after pets left behind after the 2011 disaster, and he's doing it for free. The owners of these dogs are still living as evacuees. I thought it would just be for a year or so. I had no idea it would go on this long. For the understaffed group, it's been quite a challenge. This dog needs allergy medication. This visit costs about $70. The group relies on donations, but they are drying up. Every six months, Yamaguchi takes the dogs up to Fukushima. After a 10-hour drive, Yamaguchi arrives in Itate. Most of this village is still a restricted zone. The dogs are ecstatic to see their owners. But they only get three hours to be together. Mm. Momo, it's time to go. There are other groups around Japan that have taken in dogs from Fukushima. All are hoping to reunite the pets with their owners as soon as possible. Videos of reconstruction efforts are being projected onto building walls in the northeastern Japanese city of Miyako. The city was devastated by the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. The local, a local NPO launched the event on Sunday to show how the Taro district of the city in Iwate Prefecture has been recovering from the disaster. Members of the group PR45 project videos on the exteriors of six buildings, including some damaged by the tsunami. The leader of the organization, Noriko Shindo, has visited the district more than 100 times to record the lives of the people there since the disaster. I've been watching the town recover from the tsunami. I want more people to know about the town and come here to help revitalize it. People in the video were full of life. I'm glad to see that the recovery effort is moving forward. The displays will continue in the early evening through April 17. Fishermen in northeastern Japan have reason to celebrate. It's the start of the Bonito fishing season, and that means a big boost for one city devastated by the earthquake and tsunami of 2011. Fishermen unloaded 50 tons of bonito on Monday morning in the city of Kesenima. Buyers examined the fish for size, color and fat content. They say many were rather small. The waters have been slowly recovering since the tsunami and so too have the bonito fishing businesses. Kesenume is the city of Bonito, and the fish are helping with the rebuilding process. I want to bring more cheer to the people in northeastern Japan by bringing them some bonito to eat. Fishermen hauled in more than 22,000 tons of bonito to Kesenima last year. It was the largest catch in Japan for the 19th year. A Japanese boat has returned home more than five years after it went missing following the devastating earthquake and tsunami in northeast Japan. The boat Kaisho made its homecoming in Kesenuma City. It's amazing. The boat did pretty good. A fishery laboratory in the city owns the boat. The lab suffered severe damage and lost the boat in the disaster on March 11, 2011. Fishermen discovered the boat last month drifting in waters about 2,200 kilometers in the south. That's to the south. The boat's name painted on its side had faded away, but it had no ruptures. I'm speechless to see Kaisho again. It looks better than I'd have imagined. Officials at the lab say the boat likely traveled the Pacific going as far as near Hawaii and the U.S. West Coast before it made its return. Farmers in Fukushima, Japan, have been struggling to rebuild trust in their products since the 2011 nuclear accident. Well, now, rice from the area is for sale in the Middle East for the first time. A promotion was held at a luxury supermarket in Doha, Qatar. Uh, customers got to taste freshly cooked Fukushima rice straight out of the pot. 
Well, it's the first time I'm eating Japanese rice, and I can tell it's really delicious and it's wonderful. The prefecture held a promotional campaign at a food trade show in February in Dubai. The store began selling Fukushima rice as a result. There are still some unfounded rumors about Fukushima products after the nuclear accident. Farmers are feeling very relieved that rice exports to the Middle East have started. Fukushima rice is already being exported to Singapore and Malaysia. Farmers hope to expand sales to more overseas markets. The confectionery industry in Japan has experienced a drop in sales in recent years. So to make up the difference, business owners are starting to look to other countries. People in Hong Kong head for this shop to satisfy a sweet tooth. It features more than 600 types of Japanese confections. They're imports, so they cost half again what they would in Japan. But buyers are not deterred. Taste and variety are the main attractions. Customers also cite another consideration. I feel safe eating them because they're from Japan. Hey. They're beautiful and delicious. Hong Kong is a burgeoning market for Japanese sweet shops. Back in Japan, the city of Toyohashi is pleased. As one of the main places for producing Japanese confections, it's benefiting from the overseas attention. And just in time. Sales are down two-thirds from their peak, in part because of the shrinking domestic population. Chinese tourists, on the other hand, often arrive in bus loads near the end of the day. Toyohashi is midway between Tokyo and Osaka. Sightseers often spend the night there. The number of overseas visitors to the city is five times what it was five years ago. These tourists drop their luggage at their hotel and set out on a shopping spree. They went to a drugstore where they could shop tax-free late at night. Makeup and over-the-counter medicine are popular items, as are Japanese sweets. People who buy often do so in bulk. I'm going to share them with my friends. I really like matcha-flavored sweets. Toyohashi is happy to oblige. International tourists buy lots of sweets. I hear they find the products delicious and safe to eat, as well as affordable. Toyohashi's confectioners decided to capitalize on the word of mouth and sell their products overseas. They selected Hong Kong as their first market. They asked a store that specializes in Japanese sweets to set up a Toyohashi corner. A tasting event was held to gauge reactions. The goal was to discover what kinds of sweets would have the most appeal and then to develop new products. That kind of feedback was just what a shop in Toyohashi wanted. It's produced a new kind of cake. The product is low in sugar and flavored with maple syrup, a combination that seems to suit Asian preferences. It's much better, isn't it? I think we can go with it. Confectioners have their eyes on Chinese and Southeast Asian markets, places where economic development has increased buying power. People in other countries often have a sense of flavor that's different from ours in Japan. I want to understand those differences. Understanding can then lead to creating products that attract even more customers. The purveyors of sweets from Toyohashi aim to make themselves into confectioners for the world. Japan has started harnessing renewable energy in a new way. The country's first floating wind turbine went into full service in April, and there are high hopes it will do more than just generate electricity. The turbine is floating near the Goto Islands, western Japan. 
Normally, offshore wind turbines are fixed to the ocean floor. But this pillar, 170 meters long, is held in place by chains in deeper waters. The government holds high hopes for offshore wind power. Three plants have already opened on a test basis, and 11 more are planned around the country. But some fishermen oppose the plan. They worry the sound and vibrations will drive the fish away. They're also concerned the structures will obstruct their boats. How our generators could scare off our fish, that's what we all worry about. This turbine was set up two and a half years ago. Underwater operations expert Masanobu Shibuya is keeping a check on the marine ecosystem at the request of authorities. The submerged portion of the pillar is about 70 meters long. From about 10 meters below the surface, a rich ecosystem has formed around the pillar. This includes a mass of soft coral. Shibuya spots a school of parrot bass, which fetch high prices at the market. Deeper down, groupers, another commercial prospect. In all, the surveys have identified some 100 species of marine life around the wind turbine. And it's no accident. The pillar is covered with a special paint that ocean organisms can easily cling to. The aim is to create a floating reef. Shibuya has been involved in the project since the beginning. A veteran of many undersea construction projects, he says he's surprised by the amount of sea creatures they found here. It's a big deal that fish are gathering and living here. I think it's quite possible that they will spread out into the surrounding ocean. Shibuya visited the local fishermen's association to report his findings. The pillar acts as a big reef. It's the fishermen who will be happiest about this. It will be a big step forward. I hope this kind of renewable energy project will help both the fisheries and the ocean itself. Supporters of the project say offshore wind power is turning in positive results. They now hope to convince the fishermen and open a new horizon for wind power.